Move the microphone. <laughs> so good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to our Chestnut Hill College Sugarloaf Campus, uh, to the um, uh, Chateau, the Commonwealth Chateau. So for those who don't know me, I'm Sister Kathy Duffy, and I direct this Institute for Religion and Science here at Chestnut Hill College. And I was surprised, I was trying to think, oh, when do we start? Six years ago. So this has been going on for six years. And I think it's been very fruitful. We've had some amazing speakers, and we're certainly not being outdone to today. Very fine speaker, I will say. Um, and, um, you know, those of you who know us, we're trying to uh, somehow dialogue between religion and spirituality and uh, technology and uh, science, right? To see connections so that they're not two parts of our brain, one that we use on Sunday and one we use over the rest of the week, work week. And, um, and we have some, we've had some wonderful speakers. You should always check our website under the resources section because we keep putting the videos up from the last, uh, you know, the former uh, talks. And so if you miss something, you might be able to pick it up. So we have over 20 videos at this point. And um, anyone who is not on our mailing list, if a friend told you about this and you're not on our mailing list, then you should sign up at the back. Also, um, there's a paper back here. We started this little project a couple of years ago, and I finally got on the ball. And it's starting to get off um, to a good start. But we're uh, trying to send around a petition to, to, uh, put, that will go to Pope Francis, asking Teilhard to become, be named a doctor of the church. Now, it might never happen. But I think it's worth, you know, sending it. And if ever, with a Jesuit, with a Jesuit um, pope, and who is a scientist, you know, there might be some chance for that. So, please feel free. And it, it also, this um, message appeared at the bottom of the, um, the last mailing that we had. So if you can find that, or if you want to type this in yourself, good luck. I did. I was surprised I got it right. A um, few announcements. Uh, Jack Holt's book, his new book, I had to wait until they came out of the warehouse, so it's really hot off the press, um, is back there, $25. I recommend it uh, highly. So if you haven't looked at it yet, please do that. And Jack said he would be glad to sign, autograph his books. And... Um, I think that might be all for now, except that I'm really pleased to introduce um, my good friend, Dr. John Hart, who will speak to us about Darwin and Lonergan and their view of evolution. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, after the talk, after the lecture itself, we'll break for some refreshments in the back. And, um, and then come back here, you know, bring something back and, you know, chat with one another. We'll have some time for chatting and then we'll open it again for questions or comments or discussion. Okay, we usually do that and I think it's been working well that people get a chance to do more than just let it go in one ear and out the other. It goes in one ear, out the mouth, <laughs> into the other ear and out. So I am really thrilled to introduce today's lecturer, distinguished research professor in the Department of Theology at Georgetown University, Dr. John F. Hoyt. One of the most creative and constructive theologians in the field of science and religion, Hoyt provides a brilliant and exhilarating analysis of what faith might mean in an age of science, not a small feat. The author of, what is it, 22 books now, I think, and uh, more than 100 book chapters and articles, as well as hundreds of invited lectures. I don't know how he keeps up with it. Um, he has plumbed the, de the profound depths of the universe and offers fresh insight into the biblical nature of hope. 
In order to clarify his position with the new atheists and the creationists, folks who differ from his approach, he has engaged in countless stirring debates, and in 2005, he testified as an expert witness at the Intelligent Design Trial in Harrisburg. Deeply influenced by philosophers and theologians such as Teilhard, Lonergan, Polanyi, Whitehead, several others, Hoth's contribution is intellectually adventurous, ever challenging his thinkers to think, um, his listeners rather, to think anew about the much misunderstood relationship between science and religion, especially the science of evolution. His deep concern for issues such as ecology, transhumanism, and the value of human life, the meaning of suffering and death, gives further depth and relevance to his analysis. It offers a way for believers to think about re how religion relates to discoveries in modern science, and as a consequence, suggests the possibility of a robust and credible faith. Rather than opposing religion to science, he takes a deep and serious look at the science of our time and articulates instead an evolutionary friendly theology, one that reveals a universe full of potential and promise. Unlike those who find conflict between evolution and faith in God, Hoth calls evolution Darwin's gift to theology and provides a dynamic vision of the cosmos in relation to a God whose creativity and self-giving love is drawing us into the future. Jack is a dedicated scholar, a systematic theologian, and a tireless advocate for a theology appropriate to our time. Yet despite his brilliant accomplishments, he's a humble man who has dedicated his life to an exceptionally clear articulation of a theology that not only satisfies the mind, but also touches the heart. I'm sure that you will see why Chestnut Hill College at our 2016 commencement awarded Jack an, the honorary degree, Doctor of Humane Letters. Honoris Causa. So now please join me in welcoming Jack Hoyt to Chestnut Hill College. Well, thank you, Kathy, for that overly generous introduction. I want to thank you particularly for all the support and interesting discussions I've had with you uh, over the years. You have been no small part of my enjoyment of, of this career in science and religion. I see that there are some faces here that I've seen before, but there are probably enough that I need to give you my definition of a theologian. I was just introduced as a theologian. Uh, my definition of a theologian is someone who doesn't make much money, but at least knows why. <laughs> and uh, I also like to add, as a friend of Samuel Johnson once said, that for years I tried instead to be a philosopher, but cheerfulness kept breaking in. And so this is why I'm here as a theologian today. When we talk about biology, I'm talking about evolutionary biology. And when I talk about intelligence, we're talking about seemingly the most immaterial characteristic of human existence. And our question is whether and to what extent evolutionary biology can explain the existence, as Richard Dawkins puts it, of intelligence. To quote Dawkins, Darwinian evolution provides an explanation, indeed the only the only workable explanation so far suggested for the existence of intelligence. Creative intelligence comes into the world late, as we'll see a little bit later, as the derived product of a long process of gradual change. After Darwin, we at last have a universe in which creative intelligence is explained as emerging after millions of years of evolution. <clears throat> 
Now you can see from this quotation and any of you who ever read Dawkins that he clearly has incredible confidence in his own cognitive abilities. Yet, he tells us, he insists, that intelligence, and that would have to include his own, is an outcome of a mindless and aimless cosmic and evolutionary process. So he's raising a question I want to talk about today, and as I'll show you a little bit later, it's not just my question. Some very important people have raised the same question. Can Darwinian biology provide a sufficient justification of the obvious trust or cognitional confidence, as I'll also call it, that Dawkins has uh, in his own mind? <coughs> Why that's a question that's worth discussing, I'll get into a little bit later on. But Dawkins is not alone. Owen Flanagan, professor of philosophy at Duke University, writes in his book, The Problem of the Soul, evolution produced intelligence, we are an example, but evolution does not require intelligence to yield intelligence. Evolution demonstrates how intelligence arose from totally insensate origins. So the ultimate explanation of mind or of our cognitional apparatus for Flanagan as well as for Dawkins is a mindless process. So once again, the question arises, and again I want to insist it's not just my own question, if his own mind has such lowly ancestry, how can he justify his trust in it? Uh, Daniel Dennett tells us that the designs in nature are nothing short of brilliant, but the process of design that generates them is utterly lacking in intelligence of its own. Intelligence, therefore, for Dennett also, emerged only gradually out of a totally senseless and unintelligent cosmos. How then, the question is, can Dennett justify his own cognitional confidence, of which he has quite a bit? As I said, I did not raise this question. Charles Darwin himself raised it, but never followed up on it and very few others have followed up on it too. He writes, Darwin does, with me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, and as you can see from the illustration here, ultimately from the mud or the slime, the primordial ooze from which everything else came, whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value <clears throat> or at all trustworthy? Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Richard Rorty, the late Richard Rorty, a very highly respected American philosopher, says something similar. He says, the idea that one species of organism, namely humans, is unlike all the others, oriented not just toward its own increased prosperity, which in biological terms means re reproductive success, but toward truth, and he capitalizes the word, is as undarwinian as the idea that every human being has a built-in moral compass a conscience that swings free of both social his history and individual luck. Now, Rorty has no more interest in theology than Richard Dawkins, but he's raising a question which I have not seen Dawkins follow up on, but which I would like to talk about today. It has to do ultimately with the power, the explanatory power of evolutionary explanations. In 1975, Kenneth Boulding, a well, highly respected American intellectual, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, quoted the great writer of Christian hymns, Isaac Watts, I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Boulding, again, somewhat humor uh, comically, writes, and here he's sort of speaking for what I'm going to call the scientific naturalist, writes, is it the goodness of the Lord that fills the earth with food? Selection, meaning natural selection, as the final word, 
and what survives is good. He's asking the question that I want to talk about today, and it really is right at the center of all discussions, I think, in science and theology at least, aren't purely natural explanations sufficient? You may have heard of what's called Occam's razor, which is the maxim of medieval philosopher William of Occam, who said that if you have a plurality of competing explanations, a good rule of thumb is always to use the one which makes the fewest assumptions, the simplest explanation. And now that we have a simple scientific explanation of things that we thought required a theological explanation before, why not take natural rather than theological explanations? Again, Isaac Watts, there's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glories known, and clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. And all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care, and everywhere that man can be, Thou, God, art present there. Kenneth Boulding. There's not a plant or flower below, but DNA has grown. And clouds arise and tempests blow by laws as yet unknown. However fragile life may be, tis in the system's care. And everywhere that man can be, the universe is there. He's asking a good question here. Isn't nature enough? Bear with me while I define some terms here. Naturalism is the belief that nature, including humans and their own creations, is all there is. There's no transcendent reality. This is it. Scientific naturalism, which is more specifically what I'll be talking about, is based on these assumptions, that science is the only reliable road to truth. That's the epistemological component of the definition, the metaphysical component of the definition of scientific naturalism is that only the world available to science is real. If there's something that you think is not available to science, it's not real. Uh, so reality is defined by the capacity of scientific method to discover things about the world. So nature also, since there's nothing other than nature, uh, no source of being beyond itself. Nature must be self-originating. And since there's no transcendent goal toward which it would be, would be wending its way, uh, nature is purposeless also. All causes or explanations are purely natural, and that usually means efficient and material explanations or causes arising, and this is important, arising out of the past. So that if you want to explain what's going on now, you dig back to the past and trace a series of causes from the past to the present, and that will respond to your need for intelligibility. That'll give you full explanation. Now, subspecies of scientific naturalism, a very vigorous one, a one that has ex expressed itself in many ways over the last uh, 20, 25 years, I call evolutionary naturalism. And it's the belief that evolutionary biology provides the ultimate, deepest possible explanation of all the specific traits of all living beings. And that would mean not only our physical characteristics, but even our moral aspiration, our religious longing, and our minds, our intelligence, our cognitional faculties, and our cognitional operations also have a purely biological, and that would mean ultimately Darwinian explanation. So uh, given that understanding of naturalism, my question is, is evolutionary naturalism, which I want to distinguish carefully from evolutionary biology and evolutionary science. Evolutionary naturalism is a belief, not a science. Is evolutionary naturalism, such as manifested by Dawkins, Flanagan, Dennett, and I could cite many, many others, is it reasonable? Granted, it's, it's uh, spiritually problematic for a lot of people, but is it intellectually plausible? That's what I want to talk about today. Now, it seems to a lot of people that the new picture of the universe that cosmology has given us also supports the naturalistic perspective. 
Uh, many of you have seen this image that I used before. I started using it in class at Georgetown many, many years ago. But I asked the students to imagine they have on their bookshelf 30 big books representing the roughly 13.8 billion years of the universe, the new cosmic story. Uh, in this story, the, each page would be 450, uh, each book would be 450 pages long, and each page would stand for one million years in the story. So the Big Bang would take place on page one of volume one. But what I want to emphasize today is that look at the first two shelves and part of the third. I put them in the color gray to indicate that they are t telling us about lifeless and mindless material stuff and processes. Life was not in a hurry to enter into the universe at all. The Earth spins out around the sun about four and a half billion years ago, along with the other planets. And the first sparks of life begin to glow, uh, but not terribly enthusiastically, about a billion or so years later. And life remains pretty uninteresting, relatively speaking, single-celled, until you get almost to the end of volume 29, where the famous Cambrian explosion takes place five to 600 million years ago, and then the story of life begins to speed up. Complexity comes in, in at an accelerated pace, comparatively speaking. Uh, even so, dinosaurs don't come in until you get to the end of, or to the middle, past the middle of volume 30. And on page 385, they become extinct. And when do we humans come on the scene? Uh, not until the last uh, fifth or maybe in the last tenth or so of the very last page of the very last volume. That's when intelligence uh, that Dawkins and Flanagan and Dennett are talking about finally arrives. So late that it can be explained simply in terms of the tremendous amount of time and small incremental steps that were taken during these 13.8 billion years. Isn't that enough of an explanation? And Darwin's recipe, the, Darwin's recipe which comes into play in the last row of volumes here, itself consists of what seems to be a completely insensate, mindless set of ingredients. You have lots of accidents, plus the impersonal law of natural selection, plus lots and lots of time, of lots and lots of wasted time, we might say, from a certain perspective anyway. Accidents in the origin of life, accidents in the variations or mutations that provide the raw material for, for evolution, and accidents in natural history, such as the asteroid that impacted the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago, wiping out the dinosaurs, but opening up the possibility of mammalian development and eventually primates and eventually us. If so much depends upon pure accident, how can we think of it as having anything other than a kind of mindless explanation, uh, life that is? And natural selection operates so impersonally, unjustly, and unfairly, eliminating all the weak and accepting for reproduction only those which just happen to be able to survive by accident. And then deep time. Let's talk about deep time. Richard Dawkins, in another book of his, very interesting book, somewhat in ingeniously uh, compares um, the, the flow of time to a kind of climbing up of a mountain. So imagine you have a mountain on one side of which there's a sheer vertical drop off at a perpendicular to the plane below, and on the other side a gentle slope, say at a 45 degree angle. If mind had only a biblical span of six to 10,000 years to move from primordial mindlessness to something like human intelligence, then obviously something that only takes that short amount of time would be highly improbable and you would be justified in bringing in a theological explanation for how mind comes about. But go around to the other side of the mountain and imagine the trajectory of time, the roughly 3.8 billion years that life has been around, rounded off to something like four billion. Imagine the, the story of life weaving itself, wandering back and forth on the sloped side of the mountain, 
uh, for that period of time, and then mix that up with the other two ingredients of the aimless and mindless Darwinian recipe, uh, lots of accidents, plus the law of natural selection, then the emergence of the mind could be thought of as a purely natural because mathematically probable event. Given enough time, something that's initially improbable becomes increasingly more probable. So the time itself takes the place of deity or divine intelligence in Dawkins' picture of things, and evolution is sufficient. So this is a good picture of the implications of evolutionary naturalism. And, uh, and, and Dawkins, too, is fond of citing Occam's razor. Now that we have a simple, natural explanation for how life and even mind can come about, why would we want to complicate things by bringing in a theological explanation? So the question I want to ask, then, in the light of, of these claims, is whether Dawkins can trust his mind intelligibly and reasonably and plausibly, given its ancestry, given where it came from. But let's, let's turn our attention uh, to what's going on in this room. Let, let me ask you to think about this, a little exercise here. Put yourself in the mind of an evolutionary naturalist and ask yourself if you could have complete confidence in your mind if Darwin's recipe is its ultimate and only uh, explanation. So suppose for the moment that you're Richard Dawkins or Daniel Dennett or Owen Flanagan, that would mean that you would have to agree that your ears, your nose, your feet, and other traits are ultimately there because they're products of an impersonal evolutionary trial and error experiment involving the three senseless ingredients of accidents plus natural selection plus deep time. Then, be a little bit bolder, you would have to admit, uh, and this is something initially evolutionary naturalists were satisfied to talk about our bodily characteristics, but over the last 20, 25 years, they've talked increasingly about how evolutionary biology can also explain even those qualities that we think or thought of originally as somewhat more uh, physically unavailable or more elusive or spiritual or immaterial. So if you're an evolutionary naturalist, you would also have to agree that your brain, and that would mean everything that goes on in your mind, uh, your cognitive uh, performance and your cognitive abilities are also ultimately, ultimately the product of mindless adaptive selection. So ask yourself the question, why then do you, uh, each of you, have so much confidence in your own intelligence at this moment? And if you think that maybe you don't have that kind of confidence, I think I'll give you a little exercise which will demonstrate that you do. Uh, all of us do, whether we like it or not. So the picture of evolutionary naturalism is intelligence is approximately the product of an evolutionary process, the Darwinian process, which itself came into play out of a completely blind and unintelligent physical universe. The question is, can this worldview that I'm calling evolutionary naturalism justify the trust that is needed to activate your intelligence? Is nature enough? Charles Sanders Peirce, the famous American philosopher, is famous for saying that we should never deny in our philosophy or in our worldview what we know to be true in our hearts. I don't know whether that's always uh, good advice because maybe our hearts can be misled too sometimes. But I'm more confident of what Bernard Lonergan, the famous Jesuit philosopher who wrote a book in 1956 called Insight, seven to 800 pages long, probably one of the most thorough discussions of what's going on when we're knowing uh, that you'll ever find. In this book, one of the points he makes is never deny in your worldview what's going on in your every act of knowing. In other words, if you want a coherent worldview, it has to be something that can support the confidence that's required to activate your mind. <clears throat> 
you don't have time to read 700 and 800 pages, so I'll summarize it for you in one sentence. If your worldview fails to explain what's going on in your cognitive performance, or if it fails to justify the trust required to activate your mental life, then you need to find another worldview. He wrote at a time before evolutionary naturalism was around, but there was a lot of materialist thinking, including Freudian thinking, which he was very aware of, and he's really asking us whether the materialist worldview, which is still very dominant in the academic and intellectual life of Western culture, whether it's plausible, whether it's rational. Uh, and this is what I want to talk about with you this afternoon. And what he's going to argue is that evolutionary naturalism, or any kind of materialist worldview, actually subverts the trust needed to use your mind rightly, and that's sufficient reason for declaring it unreasonable. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I found it in a book by David Sloan Wilson, a prominent American evolutionary biologist at the University of Binghamton, very well known. <clears throat> and in one of his books, he writes this. He says, rationality, reason, intelligence, is not the gold standard against which all other forms of thought are to be judged. Adaptation, Darwinian evolutionary adaptation, is the gold standard against which rationality must be judged, along with all other forms of thought. Everything that goes on in our minds is the product of an essentially aimless, blind, mindless evolutionary process, including rationality. So let's take this apart. Let's look at Wilson's statement in quotes here, and he would have to agree that this is a statement that comes from his own intellectual operations, from his own mind, or from what he calls rationality. But then he says that rationality, and that would have to include his own, is the product of adaptive evolution. That's the gold standard against which everything else has to be measured. And adaptive evolution is essentially a mindless process involving the three ingredients of Darwin's recipe. And that came into play in the history of the universe out of a background, a ground state of being, you might call it metaphysically, which is primordially, primordially lifeless and mindless. So the question would be, how do I know then that Wilson's mind in giving us this claim is not just adapting rather than telling us the truth? Uh, especially since, as many evolutionary biologists have point, pointed out, evolution works often by the cleverest forms of deception. Deception is a major feature of evolutionary uh, process. So is there some self-sabotaging of his own mind going on in issuing that statement? Kenneth Boulding says, what survives is good. Uh, here we have a biologist telling us, in effect, that what survives is true. That's the measure of truth. Well, <coughs> In conversation with that perspective, I think it's important for us to agree that our minds are fully part of nature. This is one of the great lessons that we've learned over the last century and a half of science. Our minds are fully part of nature, and therefore we need to respect the evolutionary story, the narrative of how our minds arose in natural history. So to understand your own self, it's good to go back to the prelude that was already going on in those 30 volumes that preceded your emergence. It's good to tell that story because your mind is completely continuous with that story. Every last aspect of our organism, including, let's, let's, let's agree for the moment, our, our thinking is somehow taking shape throughout that story. And that mind is, in a sense, 
narratively speaking, an outcome of this mindless natural history. To understand the natural world, then, this is what Lonergan would tell us, don't leave your mind out of the picture. You can't, I mean, our, our thought processes, processes are just as much part of nature as rocks and, and rivers and trees and everything else. So we can't really understand the natural world if we bracket what's going on our, on our minds, what's going on in your minds right at this moment. There's an inside story that we need to take into account that's just as much part of nature as the outside story. But to appreciate that, you need to become much more empirical than modern science has been. You need what Lonergan calls a generalized empirical method, which looks not only out there, but looks in here at what's going on in your cognitional life. Pay close attention, if you're going to be fully empirical, to your own cognitive activity and not just to the world out there. So how do we go about paying attention, close attention, to how our minds work? Uh, let me uh, suggest this as an exercise to be undertaken, an exercise in the kind of Lonerganian mindfulness, if you will, uh, that each of you can easily participate in right now. You're hearing, you're experiencing words bouncing off your eardrums, light waves from the screen. You're having experience. So the first and primordial cognitive act is just having experience. But as, as you can testify right now, you're not satisfied with just experiencing sounds and sensing your environment. You want to understand. You're trying to understand right now what I'm saying. You're trying to see if, if you can get an insight into what you're experiencing. And even then, you're not going to be finished with the cognitive performance that's characteristic of all human beings. You will start asking the question, is my understanding or is Hawke's understanding correct or right understanding? And when you answer that question, yes or no, it will be by way of a third distinct cognitional act that we call judgment. Yes, it is the case, or no, it is not the case that my insights or Hawke's insights are true to experience. So you have these three very distinct cognitive acts. They're not the same. Understanding is not like taking a real good look, and judgment is not like taking a really, really good look. They are complementary, but logically distinct cognitional acts. Now, in this exercise of mindfulness, try to notice that your experiencing is the result of your following a very gentle imperative that lies at the root of your consciousness. That imperative is to be attentive. Uh, it's, it's what Aristotle called wonder. All philosophy, all thought begins with wonder or being really attentive. But being attentive is not enough. You also want to understand what you're attending to. So a second imperative, distinct from the first, but related to it, be intelligent, look for insight, uh, look for understanding, expresses itself. All of this takes place spontaneously. You did not have to form a deliberate project for these imperatives to arise. They just arose spontaneously in your consciousness. And now that you're maybe gaining some understanding of what I'm saying, you're going to be asking the question, is my understanding correct understanding? And that's due to the fact that a third imperative, be critical, has spontaneously expressed itself. It takes, it takes a developmental process for the imperative to be critical to emerge. It's a transformative process that culture and 
education and, and other experiences allow us to undergo. So you have three cognitive acts, acts, three corresponding imperatives. There's also a fourth imperative, which we need not bother about today. It's the one that says be responsible, since we're not just thinking beings or judging beings or experiencing beings, we're also acting beings. So there's a fourth cognitional act, decision, that takes place, hopefully informed by experience, understanding, and judgment. So Lonergan refers to these as transcendental imperatives, be attentive, be intelligent, be critical, be responsible. So to practice his generalized empirical method now is what you're doing. You're, you're looking not just out the windows of uh, me objectively, you're looking, you're noticing, you're observing, you're attending to the fact that you're attending, the fact that you're understanding, the fact that you're judging, you're attending to this now. It takes what Lonergan calls an intellectual conversion, which most of the philosophical and cultural and religious worlds have not yet undergone to get what he means. You have to really be mindful, reflect upon what is involved in the spontaneous unfolding of your cognitional life. Now, notice the tacit faith or trust or confidence that you have always been placing in your mind's imperatives. If, for example, right now you're questioning what I just said, it's because you're being critical, you're following, you're trusting your mind's imperatives. It's impossible not to trust it at some basic level. So we're strapped to these cognitional acts, to the imperatives that underlie them, uh, and we shouldn't think of that as an imprisonment. Actually, it's the, it's the ground of liberation. The liberation of life begins, of human life, begins with this intellectual conversion and taking seriously and trying to ground and understand why we have these cognitional acts and imperatives. Now, the next step is to notice that these imperatives, too, don't just float in out of nowhere. They arise, if we reflect upon it, from a deep longing within us, which philosophers since Aristotle and before have called the desire to know. It's the deepest eros that we have. It doesn't emerge easily, and in some people it probably never comes out. <laughs> I won't give you any examples from the political world today, but, uh, um, come, but that's, that's what authentic life is. It's, coming into touch with and acknowledging that the deepest longing and the only longing you can completely trust is your desire to know. You have other desires too, the desire for pleasure or power or success or acceptance, and these can be dominant in a person's life and they're constantly conflicting with the desire to know. But true freedom means liberating the desire to know because the objective of the desire to know is truth. This to me is the best understanding of truth that I've ever heard. Truth is that which is intended by your desire to know as distinct from any other desires, and we are bundles of desires, of conflicting desires, all of us. But truth is that which is intended by the desire to know. So this, this reflection, this intellectual exercise, this radical empiricism has, given us, has gotten us inside the universe in a way that purely objectifying science, including evolutionary science, cannot uh, get us. So let's call this bundle of cognitional acts plus cognitive imperatives uh, and the desire to know that underlies them. Let's call this, this is not Lonergan's term, this is mine. Let's call this critical intelligence. And keep in mind, your critical intelligence is just as much part of the natural world of the universe as anything you see out there. And you can't therefore understand the universe unless you take into account this emerald of evolution which we call critical intelligence. Furthermore, I think you'll agree that any attempt to refute this picture of cognitive process actually employs it in the very act of trying to refute it. So it's a given. It's a given to anyone who is radically empirical or widely empirical that your mind and its operations are just as much part of nature as anything else. 
So back to the point that I think Lonergan is making and that I'm making also. Evolutionary naturalism logically subverts the trust that underlies your critical intelligence. So the picture that it gives us, that evolutionary natural, naturalism would give us, is that our minds imperatives flow from our desire to know, but to the evolutionary naturalist and materialist, the desire to know simply pops into existence out of nowhere. There's nothing in that narrative it's itself, nothing in telling the story of nature and evolution that really tells us why it is that a desire to know rather than some other desires popped into existence as they did uh, in our pre-human ancestry. And the materialist or naturalist picture is that this impersonal natural selection process, Darwin's recipe, came into play out of a formerly completely mindless and aimless cosmos. And so once again, the question, this is another way of asking the same question, why then, now that you've gone through this exercise of becoming aware of your cognitive acts, why, if you're also a naturalist, why are you paying attention to your own mind's imperatives? Why are you following them? What justification is there in putting so much trust in your mind if the evolutionary naturalist, materialist picture of nature is the exhaustive explanation of everything. So if your intelligence were merely a biological adaptation, could you reasonably trust it? Yes, you can trust it, but can you reasonably trust it to lead you to truth? In Insight, in Lonergan's book, he doesn't talk about evolutionary naturalism, but he does talk about other forms of materialist philosophy which were in the intellectual environment in which he wrote, uh, and especially psychoanalysis, Freudian, the Freudian uh, interpretation of, of consciousness, which was that consciousness or rationality just sort of emerges out of the libido, out of the id, through a process of enculturation and uh, adaptation to family life and so forth and so on. Well, <clears throat> Lonergan says at one point in Insight, <clears throat> if enthusiasm for the achievement of Freud were to lead me to affirm that all thought and affirmation, that is all insight and judgment, <clears throat> is just a byproduct of the libido then this very assertion of mine <coughs> would have to be mere assertion rather than truth-telling. And it would be from a suspect source. If I could paraphrase Lonergan in terms of uh, our question of evolutionary naturalism, <coughs> he would say something like this. If enthusiasm for the achievement of Darwin were to lead me to affirm that all thought and affirmation, all understanding and all judgment, is just a byproduct of natural selection, then this very assertion of mine would be suspect. And uh, so he's including here in this self-critique everything that Dawkins, Dennett, Flanagan, and others have affirmed. Uh, if their affirmation itself is from such a suspect source, why should we take it seriously? So to summarize then so far, <clears throat> your mind is a product of a cosmic story. An unintelligent universe, a mindless, unintentional reshuffling of particles over the course of time, which is Daniel Dennett's picture of nature, <clears throat> somehow gave rise to this very interesting process called Darwin's Recipe, which processed life into all the different forms it has taken, including eventually mind, <coughs> which gave rise, interestingly, to this desire to know and the imperatives of the mind. <coughs> How can something so splendid emerge from something so mindless? Now, the way I want to ask the question is a little bit different from Lonergan. <coughs> I want to ask this, by telling the cosmic story alone, 
Is that enough to justify the trust that you have in the capacity of your mind to find the truth? Or doesn't telling that story undermine our confidence? This is, this is my, my, my main question. How are we going to tell the story in such a way that it doesn't sabotage this wonderful outcome, the human mind that emerged from it? And as I've thought about it, and this is really one of the main themes in uh, my last book, <coughs> um, I think there are at least three ways in which we can read this cosmic story. Usually we look at only one, but I think there are two others. The first way I call archaeonomic. I used to call it archaeological, but I didn't want to confuse it with a splendid academic discipline of archaeology. But it has the connotation of digging back uh, into the past to try to explain what's going on in the present. That's what I mean by the archaeonomic way of reading the cosmic story. So uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. But there are also other ways. I, one is the analogical, and the third is what I call the anticipatory way of reading the story, and that's the one that I will argue for as we go along. The archaeonomic approach digs back into the past to explain the present, and it does so in a very interesting way, since obviously, literally, we cannot go back 13.8 billion years in time. We can do something that might approximate what we would find, namely we can take any contemporary complex organ or organism or phenomenon and break it down little by little into its subordinate constituent parts. And as we break it down into finer and finer particular constituents, uh, we find <clears throat> that we get, we approach a world in which what prevails is fragmentation, uh, dispersal. Uh, and somehow the archaeonomic way of looking at the world simply assumes, and this is what I think we need to examine, that the way to intelligibility to understand the present in cosmic process is to go back in time by breaking things down analytically. So the archaeonomic vision or reading could also be called the analytical reading of the universe. And just to be clear, I am in no way disparaging scientific method and the reductive atomistic methods of science. This is what science does. Science has to break things down to analyze them. And in fact, we wouldn't know what the cosmic story is unless we had undergone and followed the, the scientists as they analyze present phenomena and break them down and dig back into the past. <clears throat> so I'm not in any way disparaging archeology span or analysis, but I'm asking whether that is sufficient, whether an archeonomic way of looking at the universe is sufficient to give us the intelligibility that we're longing for, especially when it comes to understanding ourselves. <coughs> then there's the analogical. This is the pre-scientific, traditional, theological way of looking at the story. So if Thomas Aquinas had the story laid out before him, or Anselm or Augustine, they would probably still tell us uh, don't focus too much on what's going on here. Uh, look up above to the eternal present, to the mind of God, or to some platonic heaven to find the pure and really intelligible forms of things. Everything down here <coughs> is deficient in comparison to <coughs> excuse me, the model or the analogy uh, that exists in the mind of God. Uh, and this is a very powerfully appealing way of, of looking at the natural world. Then the third reading, uh, and this is one that many, many years of uh, steeping myself in the approach that uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was giving us, uh, is suggesting. I call it the anticipatory approach. This is not Teilhard's term. It acknowledges that the universe is still coming to birth. Uh, Teilhard says, what you have to get into your mind is that the world is still a-borning. And if you do that, then 
everything looks different. And I think religion looks different. Science looks different. Everything looks different if you acknowledge that there's no reason for us to think that these 30 volumes are any more perhaps than the dawn of the final picture or what will may, ter may turn out uh, in the future to be the case. So <clears throat> the universe is still coming into being and if it's a story, then you read it like any other story. You don't try to jump to the conclusion without reading the story. You have to follow the story and that means you have to be patient. You have to wait. Intelligibility, to put it more philosophically, is something that lies up ahead. Uh, the world cannot yet be fully intelligible here and now because it has not yet been fully actualized. It is still coming into being. And in traditional thought, being and intelligibility are correlative notions, so that something is lesser in being is less intelligible than that which is more in being. So if the universe is becoming more <coughs> then intelligibility is something for which we have to wait and perhaps even hope. And in that case, hope would not be a flight from reality. It would be epistemologically the only way to approximate, to put our minds in touch with the really real and the really intelligible. I don't have to tell you that this anticipatory way of reading things has remote ancestry also in the Abrahamic traditions, just as the analogical does in the Platonic traditions, <clears throat> and just as the analytical has its origins in the atomism of Democritus and others. So the ancient world is still living on in these three interpretations, and we're still fighting the battle. Which of these interpretations seems to be the more reasonable? The Archaeonomic approach sees the story, but no meaning and no importance. The analogical sees meaning and importance and value, but ignores them. It divorces them from the story, which today would be nothing more than a curiosity to those of the analogical bent, and there are many around. <clears throat> and the anticipatory sees the story, but insists that we have to wait for its meaning or its full intelligibility uh, to emerge. So my question comes down, if these are three different ways of reading the story, and it's so important how we do read the story, um, <clears throat> is cosmic pessimism, otherworldly optimism, or cosmic patience the most appropriate posture to take with respect to this universe? And which reading can best justify your cognitional trust? So let me turn it back to you. <clears throat> I think we all have to agree, since the religious <coughs> and ethical sensibilities of most of us in this room were shaped by the analogical tradition, that it is very compelling. It arranges the universe into a hierarchy of static vertical levels moving from matter to plants, animals, human consciousness, perhaps angelic spheres, and ultimately ultimate reality, or what we refer to as God. E.F. Schumacher, who is the devotee of the so-called perennial philosophy, suggests that you imagine that matter is represented by the letter M, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a plant by the letter X, X standing for the quality of vitality that emerges uh, in the plant. And when you go up to the level of the animal, you find something more, a Y factor, quality of sentience. So the animal has a body, materiality, plus vitality, plus sentience, and even rudimentary consciousness. Uh, humans are M plus X plus Y plus Z because they have the added factor as far as we know. They're the only beings who not only know, but that they know that they know, that they can perform the kind of mindfulness exercise that I asked you to undergo uh, a while ago. You can't imagine your dog or your pet doing anything like that. So uh, it's, this, this hierarchical vision appeals to our common sense. Every ethical 
and political system in the world to some degree models itself on it. So it's very compelling. Uh, and in it, nature, the natural world, has value because each level in its own way participates in or sacramentalizes the infinite meaning, truth, and value that we refer to as God. And in this scheme, <clears throat> the more important something is, the more immaterial it is. So if you have this view, and this is your world view, then you're going to be somewhat reluctant to make anything of what the evolutionists tell us about mind because you're so uh, impressed by the immateriality of it all that no physical process could ever explain how it came about. And so much of the resistance to evolutionary thinking at all levels, I think, comes from the fact that the Western mind has been trained, a very, has been drenched by this hierarchical um, static vertical picture of things in which mind is more real than matter because it's more immaterial than matter. And God is most real because God is the most immaterial of all. So this, this is the mindset within which science came into the modern world and eventually into the 19th century world with Darwin's evolutionary picture. So you can understand why it's so traumatic for so many people. It's, spiritually up, it's a spiritual upheaval that seems to be involved. So what's wrong with it? Uh, certainly it can justify and has justified trust in human minds for centuries uh, because if our minds participate in the immaterial being of the infinite consciousness or mind that we call God, that should be enough reason to give us some confidence in our cognitional abilities. It's when you start from below rather than come from on high that the question of how can you be confident about your cognitional trust arises. And the problem today in a scientific age with this analogical reading, uh, venerable and beautiful and lovely as it is, is that it has no sense of deep time. It has no sense uh, that something more can be accomplished over the course of a long, long period of time. Uh, <clears throat> it tends to think that anything that comes out of the mud is dragged back into the mud whereas the Darwinian picture has something interesting emerging. So it has no appreciation, or very little at least, of the new scientific story of the mind's gradual emergence. Time, uh, ever since Plato, has been looked upon pejoratively, somewhat negatively, as, as, the, as the context within which things fall apart rather than the context in which things become more. So um, we have a problem then. The, arche the, arche the analogical vision won't work. What about the archaeonomic reading? Is that, uh, just to summarize what I've been saying already, uh, it cannot uh, satisfy us either. It cannot provide, in fact, it undermines confidence in our minds. Uh, it dig digs back into the past uh, to, to explain the present. It's intellectually appealing, though, because it can reduce X, Y, and Z in the hierarchical vision. It can reduce them all to materiality, atomistically. And there's something intellectually appealing. There always has been since Democritus about the analytical vision of existence. It collapses the analogical hierarchy of being, matter, which is the lowest level in the <clears throat> analogical approach, becomes the dominant feature in this new picture of the universe. Life comes in only as a kind of fluke in the last row of volumes. And mind, that doesn't pop into existence except as a kind of cosmic afterthought on page 450 of the last volume. Uh, and meaning, uh, which is the highest level of all in traditional analogical thinking, uh, meaning, including religious, all religious ideas and so forth, uh, is nothing more in the modern and postmodern mind than the projection of the forlorn human mind of its own longing <clears throat> for warmth onto the coldness of this impersonal universe. So um, it's collapsed the cosmic hierarchy. So it leaves us then with a question. Can we in any way preserve the religious fervor of the analogical approach uh, while at the same time embracing the new scientific story 
of the universe. And this is what I've tried to, to, to do in the, uh, in the anticipatory approach. The archaeonomic, the archaeonomic reading can't justify trust in our minds because the farther back it goes in analyzing the world, the more everything crumbles into incoherence. Instead of finding intelligibility, another word for which is coherence, the analytical approach only leads us back to a, a pile of sand and leaves us sifting that. So what I'm going to propose then is that let's follow the analytical approach back as far as it can, but let's leave the archaeonomists sifting their sand. And when we get back there, turn around 180 degrees and look toward the future and see what's going to happen if you wait. You can't expect to understand a pre-atomic particle until you see what it does in the context of an atom, which is much later on in the process. You can't understand what an atom is unless you wait and see what it can do with others in the context of molecules. And then later, molecules in, in the context of cells and cells in the context of organisms. In other words, reality becomes more and more intelligible to us, more coherent, in other words, only by our waiting, our anticipating what might come about in the future. And this would be as true today in this apparently late stage in our universe, but maybe still what will turn out to be early chapters in the eventual run of the cosmos. So let me propose then an anticipatory reading. And in the process of doing this, uh, giving you a sense of how I see the connection uh, of science to religion and their complete compatibility uh, as arising especially well in the anticipatory approach. So this begins with the admission, once again, that your mind is indeed a recent outcome of evolution and before that of those other volumes in our cosmic story. But let's, let's acknowledge, and this is completely acceptable sci to science today, that your mind is also part of a whole cosmic awakening, a drama of cosmic awakening, which has been going on since the very first moments. Look upon the cosmos not as reshuffling of particles, but as a story of an awakening. The universe, in this view then, is, is, the universe itself, of which we are a part, has always been an anticipation of what only becomes conscious when human minds come about, has always been anticipating and hence has always been in the grasp of what our great religious traditions refer to as infinite being, meaning, truth, and goodness. So that, going back to the imperatives of your mind, to try to understand why you have the imperatives to be attentive, intelligent, critical, responsible. Think of your imperatives not so much as forceful instructions, but as responses to some calling so that the, the imperative to be attentive which leads us to experience the world is in some sense the call of being. It's the lure of meaning or intelligibility that elicits from us the imperative to be intelligent. It's the power of truth which elicits from us the imperative to be critical. And as I said before, it's much, much harder the further you go down these imperatives for these imperatives to actualize themselves. And the attraction of the good which issues or invites us to be responsible. Now, the way in which a religious worldview, then uh, contemporary religious or theological worldview uh, would look at all this is to insist that nothing, absolutely nothing uh, in science has to be rejected, has to be edited out in order to allow that 
the world as a whole is awakening to what, let's call it imperishable or indestructible rightness. I use the term rightness because I'm following Carl Jasper's idea that somewhere between two to 3,000 years ago at various parts of our planet, there was a kind of almost simultaneous awakening on the part of members of our species to a, a rightness which is imperishable. You find it in, for example, in ancient Taoism. They talk about the right way or the Tao. You find it in Buddhism, which talks about the need for right mindfulness, right wisdom, right associations, right enjoyment, right desiring. So a distinction between wrong and right uh, begins to, to, to develop at various spots on our planet. You find it in Israel, where the prophets ask the question, what is right? Uh, at the mass this morning, we said it is truly right and just. For the prophets, what is right is what is just. Mishpat, sedeka, a strong sense of rightness, of justice emerging. In fact, uh, the word uh, justice could just as well be translated uh, rightness. We usually mistranslate it as righteousness or misleadingly translate it as righteousness. Or in Plato, the distinction between opinion and truth or in Brahmanism between illusion and reality. Uh, this awakening to rightness, I, th I think we can look at it as a new chapter in the awakening of the universe. A universe which awakened first to matter, then to life, and then to mind, or sentience, then mind, is now very, very early in the stages, and precariously so, of awakening to an imperishable rightness. That the whole universe, therefore, has been anticipating what becomes conscious and explicit in the human anticipation of being, meaning, truth, and goodness, or what we can call rightness. And if you adopt this worldview, it would seem to me that you can fully accept what science has been telling us, and at the same time, it would give you a very good reason uh, to trust your mind. There's a lot more to be said, but I think I've gone on long enough, so thank you for your patience. So thank you, Jack, for that excellent uh, talk now. Um, I have a new idea for a book. Um, last year in our book circle, we read, Without, um, without uh, Buddha, I Could Not Be a Christian. It was a great book. We, le we learned a whole lot about Christianity. So, so now my book title would be Without Teilhard and Hot. <laughs> I would not be a believer, and that's really true. And so I really want to thank you for this talk, which was, I think, so much of what has really helped me to become an active believer rather than a, you know, just a accepting whatever I'm told to believe. So um, once again, thanks a million. And what we're going to do now is um, the, there's some refreshments in the uh, room behind us. And you can go there for a little bit and then bring something in to drink and eat here and talk to the group in, at your table. And maybe you can come up with some questions or comments or, um, you know, whatever you would like to do. Okay, so why don't we do that now? And um, let's say maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I'll call you back and we can uh, finish up. Okay, we do it. Thank you. All right, let's uh, come together, those of us who are staying. And... Um, No, that's right. He had to go to get, catch a bus. I hope he makes it. Uh, so um, John, Jack will be glad to answer some questions, hopefully, if they're not too hard. <laughs> I, I'm joking, of course. Uh, so if, if somebody's interested, I think we usually have extra mics. I am, I'm so out of it these I can days. repeat the question, too. Well, yeah. Great. Yes. Yep. Is this one? Oh.
Hello. Yes. A question over here. Who who has a question? Okay. There you go. Thank you, Professor. I have a question. Uh, first of all, I'm under the belief, at least, that uh, natural, that critical thinking and logical reasoning does not come natural to us. Yeah. Am I correct yeah. in understanding that? Well, um, I think that's the analogical approach, and most pro people uh, might feel that way. What I'm arguing is that um, you, can, you can approach the whole, you can approach the world from a natural point of view, but you can also look at it theologically uh, as well. What I, what I want to avoid is the idea that any um, dignity or value that we give to the human mind uh, does, does not have to contradict what science tells us about the gradual evolution of that mind. And this is what so many people are afraid of. They're afraid of that picture, which was a caricature of, in the Victorian period of what Darwinism implies. It implies that we're all being dragged down into the mud because there are no sharp breaks, as it were. So the typical reaction on the part of Bishop Wilberforce and, and even um, some of Darwin's own scientific friends was to react, you know, you're, you're saying something that's going to demean and diminish us. And that's been the fear ever since Darwin. And uh, some, uh, nat the evolutionary naturalist is quite content to say that mind is ultimately reducible to lifeless, mi mindless stuff. They're quite content because that's intellectually, analytically appealing. It's a very nice simplification of things. But what I'm arguing is simplification is not necessarily the road to intelligibility. And if we want to fully understand what's going on in the human mind, we need to read the whole universe differently without in any way leaving out any of the steps that science has taken in uncovering that story, but reading it not archaeonomically, but reading it as though it's still awakening. Uh, and uh, that doesn't violate science uh, it, at all. It, it violates materialism. But materialism is not science. Materialism squeezes the juice out of the story, it seems to me. Uh, and uh, so in, in no way do I want to uh, uh, diminish what science has accomplished. But I want to distinguish drastically between science and scientism, the belief that science is the only road to truth. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, Professor, when you were talking early on about Lonergan, uh, a, a saying or a maxim <coughs> popped into my mind. I can't remember where it came from, but somebody famous, I think, said it. And I say it uh, to get your reaction or commentary, mm -hmm. and it's this. The heart has reasons that reason does not know. Yeah, that's Pascal. Um, uh, Pascal. Pascal, the philosopher, uh, contemporary of Descartes, uh, who disagreed with Descartes. Descartes was too you know, up in his mind, and Pascal said no. There, and uh, and I think there's a, uh, that's metaphorical language, uh, and I think Pascal would agree. And, and I think what, where Lonergan picks that up is in his emphasis on the cognitional process as having its origin a deep, deep longing or desire, or he sometimes calls it eros. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an erotic longing. And as, actually, as Lonergan's thought developed uh, as he got older, he, he, he argued that from a theological point of view, what, what he called philosophically the desire to know is deep down in the love of God. It's, it's love uh, that, that un underlies uh, our cognitional process deeply from a theological point of view. You don't bring this up. But there, my point is there are different ways of looking at uh, what's going on. Scientific Science deliberately and rightly leaves out any talk about God, value, uh, subjectivity, uh, and, and br puts all those in brackets. And it accomplishes something quite wonderful by a self-limiting method that it uses. But um, precisely because it's self-limiting, 
Science has always left things out. It's left out the value, the beauty, the insideness of things, and focused on the outside story. And what, what Lonergan says, well, we need to be radically empirical. We need to take into account what the heart desires, uh, and, and uh, not just what the mind is satisfied with. So, yeah, thank you. That's it's, it's a very good corrective. Uh, Oh, here's an old friend from the past. Wonderful <laughs> talk. So happy to be Thanks here. Thanks for coming. <laughs> joy, a joy. <laughs> um, I'm a big uh, science fiction film buff. Uh, we just chatted. One of my favorite recent science fiction films is a film called Her. Is, is that a familiar film no, to you? No, I'm not, I'm not uh, into science well, fiction. Well, it's about a guy, a young guy who falls in love with, how would you describe the, the token of his admiration? What was it? Yeah, he, you know, basically, basically fell, fell, fell in love with with what would boil down to an avatar. It was just a, mm -hmm. and and it, it it really raised questions for me, uh, uh, namely, the difference between sexuality, sensuality, and intimacy. And mm -hmm. and you know, he falls in love in effect with a hard drive, and develops this very <laughs> intimate relationship with this hard drive over time. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be a trend in his world because yeah. other other people are doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what what I find interesting about it is that most of the science fiction that I've seen currently, uh, it's it's all about crazy stuff happening in this new world, uh, all of which generates questions about meaning. Mm -hmm. And in in most of the films, the questions of meaning. Uh, resolve in questions about God. You know, whether they're implicitly about God, they're <coughs> implicitly about God. Mm -hmm. And I just find that really interesting. Uh, plus, um, could, you, could you say a few things about uh, transhumanism and, uh, you know, uh -huh. um, what? It could be a whole talk. It, it, it could be a, ho a, ho a whole talk, but, no. but yeah, no. but the question no. of uh, yeah. being attentive, being intelligent, being critical, yeah. being responsible, yeah. Yeah. those qualities yeah. heightened by artificial intelligence. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that seems right. to be where we're moving. Right. I mean, right. heightened, uh, hi heightened yeah. sense of all of this. Yeah, this, this Using technology. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot to talk about here. And, uh, developments in robotics and, and computer science and, and, and uh, nanotechnology and all the rest do raise the specter of... Uh, uh, I, want, I want to put it cosmically, is, the, is this a new chapter in the cosmos, just as the emergence of life was a new chapter and the emergence of consciousness? And um, whether in this human future or transhuman future, uh, whether what I talked about in today's talk will have any chance of surviving, namely the world, this insideness. Um, it seems to me that so much discussion of transhumanism in the scientific world still continues modernity's uh, obliviousness to interiority, to subjectivity. And in a way, I see the, the whole point of the universe as laboriously bringing birth to subjectivity and interiority. And that's really not part of Dennett or Dawkins or most scientific ways of looking at the world. And yet it's only because of subjectivity, the birth of subjectivity, that the universe has been able to become conscious of itself. Without subjectivity, it would almost be as though nothing exists at all. So the birth of subjectivity, that, by that I mean center of experience, which blossoms eventually into the imperatives of the mind, the desire to know, and so forth. That's the great uh, outcome. That's what evolution has been working for for so many billions of years. So now, if, if there's something coming in the future that, that threatens to cut that off, then to me, that, that would be... Uh, undesirable, let's put it that way. Uh, and not just subjectivity, but vitality. We haven't really talked today about what it is for something to be alive. And, and uh, when we talk about uh, robotics and computer science, uh, the major question is, in what sense, if at all, uh, do they have vitality? For example, uh, to be alive, most living beings in the past, <coughs> 
have had to know what it is to strive. And striving brings a note of drama into the universe because striving can have two outcomes. It can have either success or failure. Whether it's an amoeba looking for a food supply or a predator uh, chasing its prey or prey trying to get away from its predator or as a sophomore uh, studying uh, books or reading books in, in the library to find meaning in their life. What, what keeps life continuous throughout the many versions it's gone through is this striving. But striving can, can, can have two outcomes. It can be, be successful or it can be tragic. So that it, it introduces a notion of drama into the cosmos that has been actually a borning since day one, since the first microsecond of the cosmos. Uh, so the cosmos t has meaning only because it has this, this capacity to bring forth uh, newness, uh, to bring forth meaning. And uh, so if that drops out, uh, then it's not, a, to me, it's not, a, it's not bringing about more. The anticipatory universe is always looking for more being to emerge on the, on the future horizon. But if you lose vitality, if you lose subjectivity, and also a third ingredient, if you lose capacity for intense interrelationality, um, those are three things the universe has, has, has brought about. If we were to lose them in any sense, that would be tragic. So, so I think we need a, an ethic. Uh, we need to talk about what would be a, an ethically um, uh, acceptable future for humanity. And, and the, most talk about transhumanism doesn't talk about vitality, subjectivity, or relationality. But yet that's what the cosmos has been in the business of bringing about. Uh, those are also ecological criteria, as Thomas Berry uh, brings out in his works, uh, communion, diversity, um, interrelationality, and subjectivity. Those are the things the universe has, has, has gifted us with. So if those are in any way to be diminished, then that would be a problematic future. But at the same time, maybe there are ways in which technology can enhance those, those three values. Those, those would be my way of, of looking toward the future. Thank you very much. much more to be said than that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for that wonderful talk. Um, for me, the last thing that you said is much more compelling as an argument, the, the subjectivity and the experiential component, mm -hmm. than the, the exercise of can we trust the mind? Because I think that our mind be, is relatively trustworthy uh, most of the time. It, it can be seen as an emergent property that can be lost. In fact, mm -hmm. many of us, unfortunately, yeah. lose our mind yeah. at some yeah. point mm -hmm. in time. So that, that, that concept of the experience and the subjectivity is very, very important yeah. as, as, a, as the, the counter argument yeah. for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think Maynard has a question or a comment or something to say. Thank you. Uh, Freeman Dyson, um, who uh, uh, a great contemporary theoretical physicist uh, occupied Einstein's chair at Princeton Institute for years. Um, when he received the Templeton Prize, famously, he said, the more I reflect on it, the more I am convinced that the universe seems to know that we were coming. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear yeah. you, your comment <laughs> on that. Well, uh, yes. I mean, what he's talking about is what what used to be called the uh, the anthropic principle that the initial conditions and fundamental constants of the universe that we live in are uh, calibrated to such a precise degree of precision, so that the value of the expansion of the universe or the gravitational constant have to have been just pretty much what they are. Nowadays, people like Martin Rees have added to that that um, the, the amplitude of the ripples of radiation in the early universe 
had to be precisely what they are if they were to be the seedlings, which would allow stars and galaxies to form, and galaxies were necessary to heat up hydrogen and helium to become carbon, and carbon was necessary to have life, and life's necessary to have mind. So uh, what Dyson was talking about, I think, was mind. In order for, and that's what I've been talking about this morning, in order for mind to be here, uh, the way I like to put it, I think I'm saying essentially the same thing, is that the awakening that we experience now in our own desire to know and the imperatives of our, mi of our minds in this room right now, this awakening uh, didn't begin uh, just when our species came about. It, it started with the, with the structuring, the physical uh, characteristics of the uh, infant universe. 13.8 uh, billion years ago. And, and so it seems to me that it's possible uh, intellectually and plausibly to, to look upon this universe as one in which a constant awakening has taken place rather than archaeonomically trying to reduce everything awake to something asleep. Uh, so uh, uh, it's just a, so yeah, I, I, I'm pretty much in sympathy with uh, his, uh, his work, Disturbing the Universe. So I haven't had the opportunity to ask him, but the, the next the question that I'd like to ask him or ask you, does the universe know where we're going? <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I think the best I could say is that uh, uh, it's reaching, and that's part of the drama. It's striving. Um, uh, and I think it, there's some suspense as to whether it will be successful or not. But uh, this is where uh, I, I fall back on, and I do so quite gladly, um, the element of faith. And I often repeat to myself Jesus' words, when the Son of Man comes, will there be any faith upon the earth? I love that because what it does, it tells us that uh, what we have to do, no matter what, in, in, with uh, keeping the uncertainty of the future in mind, is to keep faith alive. And as, I've, as I wrote this last book, it occurred to me that the heart of most faith is waiting, uh, patience. Um, and it, that seems to me to correspond with the biblical idea of the authentic life. The authentic life is the life which believes that God's promises will be fulfilled. Uh, when Luke addresses Mary in the infant story, the Luke in infant story when uh, the angel addresses Mary, uh, he, he responds to her by saying, uh, or Elizabeth uh, responds to her, uh, by saying that blessed is she who believed that God's promises would be fulfilled. That's the authentic biblical life, but, but that means patience and, and waiting. Uh, and increasingly, I've, I've come to see patience and waiting not as unrealistic, but as the epistemological heart of an anticipatory universe. If the universe is still coming into being, uh, then it's not, we can't expect it to be fully intelligible any time short of its final fulfillment, whatever that might be. Uh, so right here and now, the way in which we face reality is not to give up the cosmic pessimist would say, well, the pessimism is the only realistic position. The analogical devotee would say the only realistic uh, way to live your life is an expectation that you will be snapped out of the world of matter and come face to face with God eventually. The anticipatory approach says, no, you face reality by accepting that today is not the end of things, but each day is seeded with promise. And uh, to go back to Freeman Dyson's point, the, the, I like to see the cosmos as seated in the beginning, not with perfect design, uh, that's the intelligent design approach, but with the potentiality or promise of becoming something more. Uh, so um, I don't think we're in a position to answer the, these questions fully because intelligibility is something for the future, not for today. But in the meantime, we can wait and hope and we can try to sustain what the universe has produced so far. I'm glad you mentioned Jesus because as Christians, it's his, the body and the blood, the organic, which is the fundamental a priori assumption here on which our further evolution as humans. Mm -hmm. So what, what is happening is right under our noses here and it's happening exponentially, not linearly. 
um, our humanity, what has been taken for granted, is being redefined, transhumanism, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, such things as direct neural implants exist. Uh, humanity has fallen into being dependent on systems of machines. Mm -hmm. And it's all very complex and it's escalating. And it's not just science fiction. So mm -hmm. I would appreciate yeah. some direction here if uh, the application of science and this worldview in its applications is such that the very meaning of the body and the blood, the organic mm -hmm. nature of life and life's mm -hmm. awareness and of unfolding yeah. consciousness yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. is there, mm -hmm. uh, what is an ever-expanding conscious Christian to do? Yeah. And I, I should add, I, I didn't, because this was not, uh, this is more philosophical than theological talk, but uh, mm -hmm. from a theological point of view, the, uh, from an, and a Christian theological point of view, the meaning of the Christ in history is, uh, among other things at least, that the divine, the God, takes into the divine life all the struggle and suffering and, and uh, agonies and, and drama of the cosmos itself. And so from a religious point of view, from a Christian point of view, that to me is what we can hope for, the, 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 the complete fulfillment of the cosmos in God. Just want to continue on with maybe the technological change. Um, I, you may see it with your students, perhaps, um, with the cell phone being ubiquitous. Um, and are they as attentive as one would uh, want them to be with in, in being intelligent, critical thinking, um, uh, responsible? Sometimes there's a component with sites to call to action, and everyone can meet up. At a, uh, and there is a group called Meet Up. Uh, that they can do social, socially responsible things. But I'm just wondering, because there's such a bombardment with all of us, with all this technology, um, are this, this generation in this room certainly moves away, shuts down a little bit, and can be reflective. Mm -hmm. The next generation is totally bombarded. Maybe it is pushing the mind. Mm -hmm. Maybe there will be a new brain coming out of this that can handle all that, that our generation cannot. And I'm not sure if yeah, this is something yeah. you talk about a lot. <laughs> oh, I, I completely agree. And I'm, fr I'm scared, too, of, of uh, what's going on in terms of critical, uh, exercising the imperative to be critical. And, and uh, I, wanted, I should have pointed out, too, that th th there's a circumcision or an interrelationship of all these imperatives so that the more responsible you are, the more you would turn back and be more attentive, more intelligent, more critical. And you would never uh, allow your ethical sense of responsibility to just hang there independently of what you found out through the other imperatives. So there's a, an ongoing development, hopefully, of, of all of these. But there are, as Lonergan admits in, in, uh, in Insight, there are backward movements in history. There are times when, as Whitehead says, civilization is in full decay. But nonetheless, that doesn't, and for both of these thinkers and for many others that I admire, there's still that spark that cannot be quenched. So even in the most perverse consciousness, these imperatives are still, are still at work. Um, even, even in the scientific materialists, they're at work. But what happens in materialism is that the imperative to be attentive turns out to be be attentive only to what science can tell you. Uh, be intelligent says uh, look only for things that are measurable. Or be critical means leave out any talk about subjectivity or meaning or purpose and so forth. So these, these imperatives, they're still there. There's still a spark there, but they can be uh, misapplied and they can be truncated and dwarfed and diminished and uh, so what you need is a culture that keeps these imperatives of alive, alive. The fundamental criterion of truth is fidelity to the desire to know. So if you allow the desire to know to be diminished or the imperatives to weaken, then truth is what is uh, sacrificed and I think we're witnessing that all over the place, not just in our young people but in our uh, pol politicians and, and so forth too. So uh, what do we do? Uh, I think this is still relevant. We, as, as Irenaeus said, the glory of God is the human being fully alive. And I th what that means is 
allowing the, the, the desire to know to have free play, to liberate the desire to know. That's, that's what needs to be done. And I don't think it can, personally, I don't think it can, can be done without a sense of faith and without a sense of uh, the infinite. So. so here's the last question. Professor, um, now the definition of truth we often apply in science is that of correspondence. Am I? The, the correspondence that's, definition of truth? That's, yes, that's ba one way based on correspondence. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it, now, mm -hmm. the definition of truth you applied here is different from that. Yeah. Can you explain to me, therefore? Well, yeah, okay. The, how even how in, you can reconcile the, this? Yeah. In, in the, the Middle first. Ages, the okay. philosophers, uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, defined truth as the adequatio intellectus et re, the adequacy, the correspondence of the mind to the real. But uh, the more real something is, in the analogical vision, the more you have to undergo a personal transformation in order to, to uh, come close to that adequatio. And eventually you realize that the mind is, is never something that can comprehend the divine because the, the, the classical view operates according to the hierarchical principle that a higher level can comprehend or encompass the lower, but a lower cannot encompass the higher. So, in the scheme of things, if God is the highest level, then human consciousness cannot expect to grasp or comprehend the divine. However, it can have an awareness of being grasped by it. And that's, that's, that's the state to which we, we, we aspire, the, the state where we can become aware of being taken into the, the divine. Uh, and that's where the desire to know reaches its uh, natural <laughs> fulfillment. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think we're all a little bit wiser, <laughs> hopefully, than we were when we came. So thanks so much, Jack. Thanks for coming all this way and being with us and thank sharing you. everything with us. Thank uh, all of you, too. Yeah. And thank you for coming all this way, even if it was down the street or around the corner. But um, I just want to remind you, we have two more uh, events coming up uh, in November. This, I think it's the 2nd and the 14th. On the 2nd, the topic is dreaming, a gateway to the unconscious, question mark. And uh, Bob Novak, a Christian, or, um, Irish Christian brother, is going to come on the 14th to talk about his spiritual ins insights on studying the atmosphere of Mars. He's a, an astronomer, and he does a lot of work with his students in astronomy and, and uh, you know, goes to some of these big telescopes and all. So I think you'll enjoy both. Please come. And they'll be evenings. They're, they're not uh, weekends, okay? So safe home, and thank you again for coming. <laughs>